Welcome to Crime and Politics, what we call our show about the intersection of criminal justice and political corruption and the systemic solutions we need. And there are many crossroads there. Mm -hmm. So, as I like to do, I have a question for you to start off with. What's your question? Do we need a government? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) In a government (laughs) by the people, for the people. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think my answer to that would be yes, because if, if we don't have a government, then then personally, I'm kind of dead. <laughs> if we don't have a government. We don't have like functioning pharmaceuticals. <laughs> yeah. And why, why do you say that? <laughs> well, just because I have certain products produced by the uh, pharmaceutical companies that if, if I don't get on a regular basis, then... I'm kind of dead. <laughs> yeah, anybody with a chronic disease that's that's uh, reliant on, on medicine for sure. I mean, the other thing too is I, I think about you know um, people like anthropologists that study the the history of humanity says that once once you kind of went past uh, nomadic societies is when you had uh, groups of more than 200 people. So so basically, you know, history will go in, and tell you that if you have a group of more than 200 people uh, together, you're going to need some sort of, of way of or- organizing and governing uh, each other. So as much as, as it can be easy to say within the left that, uh, you know, we're, we're anarchist or anything like that, the, the reality is uh, for us to maintain a high uh, standard of living, we do need some kind of government, just a government that's not bought. So while there, there may be um, a certain um, group of young people who, who can say we don't need a government, we just want to go live independently and, and make independent uh, communities and whatnot, is really not going to work for, I don't know, would you say even the majority? I don't know, the majority is not going to go for it, put it that way. It wouldn't work for the, for the majority. I think any anytime you had anybody with any kind of chronic disease chronic illness uh it certainly wouldn't work for families uh mm, i think kids, yeah. i think a, a big part of uh of of a government is, is kind of the, the promise of of a rule of law you know there's there's a lot of necessities there that are required when when we live in you know cities and states and, and countries it's just about taking that power back to the people and if things kind of go post-apocalyptic it, it kind of goes poorly for for a lot of us and you know i think of of like the like the walking dead world and just apropos of nothing but but i i think of like do you remember herschel oh definitely <laughs> you remember how it went for old herschel in, in the walking dead is i mean first first he got his leg cut off mm-hmm. <laughs> and, he, and he still hung in for a while but it's tough to be an old guy in, in the post-apocalypse. Yeah, and, and even so, uh, Herschel basically survived because other people, I mean, he had his own values. He had lots of experience, and he was great mm. to talk to. He had his own values, but, you know, he basically survived because other more able-bodied survivors took care of him in some way. And yeah, there just aren't that many old guys um, in the post-apocalypse, <laughs> right? And and the thing is, it, it's nice to kind of fantasize about this idea of this, you know, anarchic uh, egalitarian society where we all take care of each other. I, I think it's just not super duper realistic. So you know, the the reality is is we need to learn to work with within a system, uh, just to, you know, taking that that system and bringing it back. I'd say we we need to make it work. We need to kind of treat it like we always treated like nuclear weapons or or like a mutually assured destruction and and it wasn't at least not until recently um the the idea of 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 a world war three you know nuclear war was just um unthinkable and so it wasn't about whether or not we would do it it's it was about what's the best way what's the best path we can manage to make sure that it doesn't happen I feel like we should be thinking of the the government, the system, and the democracy, you know, in that way. In that we we really have to have a, a functioning democratic government. And so, if you accept that, then the question is, what's the best, or maybe even the least worst course to getting there? Right. And so this gets into uh, to somewhere within the lefty circle where some people have some different ideas, and I think we're going to be talking about that. 
So a lot of times in, in what we call our, our lefty circles, they, they talk about it as almost this, this competition between mutual aid and direct action on one side and electoral politics on the other side. And one of the ways that, that I'd like to, to talk about it or think about it rather than as this competition, why can't we think of it as the two things working together in that one or the other isn't going to get us there. Mutual aid and direct action are, are a tool that's crucial and education is crucial and these things are, are crucial, but just by itself, it doesn't get you systemic change in terms of, of making a government that works for all of us. Electoral politics is crucial to that and it, it's democracy and we need real democracy. But of course, as we've seen recently, simply voting for the the parties that that were given and the choices were given isn't getting us anywhere it's just getting us more of the same corrupt government and so the the question is how can we how can we get there and like i'll bring up something from my eric t red site the site that i have that i have the demands on and different things and notes and and resources And so mutual aid direct action, rather than framing these things as being in competition, let's talk about doing both together. How can we collaborate? And there's the mutual aid on one side and direct action, and then there's radical electoral politics is what I would propose on the other side in that not just not just this idea of of just simply voting or just simply doing electoral politics, but doing it in a new demanding way. And step one is to have a set of demands. Oh, and I, I forgot to say the title of this episode, which is Demands. And we're going to be talking about these uh, demands for real democracy. And then when you have that, that's a tool that becomes the core of what you're doing and, and what you're demanding. And so when we're doing direct action, I mean, the, the demands need to be at the center of that. When we're doing electoral politics, we put demands at, at the center of it. And so item two, we, we demand it of every candidate or representative. And if they're not on board with it, then, then we call them out. We call them out in a, in a serious way, in a direct action way. Provide zero support for Democrats and Republicans until they start enacting the demands. That means no votes, no money, no praise, because they're not doing it provide all possible support and aid to third party and independent candidates who do support the demands. If you're getting roadblocks, you know, you intensify and and just be be relentless about pointing out the real source of our problems. The top 1% versus the rest of us. That is the fight. Yeah, and the direct action that that can come from that is is like you said, more people need to go to these events and confront these politicians or people that are are running for these seats and make it difficult for them and present these demands and and make them uh, either give an example of of whether they support or whether they don't. It's also about pulling away the money from the two-party systems uh, and and supporting third party until we see major changes. I actually see uh, it a little bit uh, for for mutual aid and direct action. I view it almost as a, as a pathway to to the radical electoral politics. Mm-hmm. I think that one of the things with with mutual aid and direct action is it's not going to be sustainable for three hundred million people or whoever many people we have in the United States. It's I, I think that it's it's a great idea and it's and it's noble to do and I do encourage it. I do think that we need to be realistic and say that we are people. Uh, we have biases and we are mainly going to benefit mutual aid and direct action to people that that are in line with us or think similarly to us. So where I see it being connected is we can have mutual aid and direct action to going through to support people that could uh, become political challengers. Uh, And so, you know, it's by doing that mutual aid and direct action, we can strengthen the left but what that really needs to come come back to is that that radical electoral politics. We think about uh, candidates. Uh, Shama Sawan is is one that that with socialist alternative. Socialist alternative so far hasn't put money towards national elections, but there could be framework for that in in, in principle in the future. And so take that mutual aid direct action, strengthen the left. But we still need that electoral politics if we're going to make massive countrywide level change. And if we're, we're doing strikes, you know, mutual aid is a huge part of, of strikes and those kind of movements. And that if you're having people who are walking away from their jobs or striking from their jobs or even doing boycotts, withholding their money in different ways, so the mutual aid can be a big part of that as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the mutual aid is great for people that can support it. I, I don't know how many independently wealthy people that we have on our side because those people tend to, to not necessarily be interested in left politics. But yeah, of course, there, there's just the the... 
whole basis of you know take what you need leave what you can so yeah and in general one of the frustrations i see with with a lot of people on on the left or one of my frustrations even with people i like is that they do a really good job a crucial job of, of educating people of talking about what what the problems are out there and so then that's step one i recognize it i go to okay what's step two what do we what do we do about it and it just feels like we don't ever get to a step two <laughs> and and to me you know that step two is about what we're talking about having demands having you know doing a radical electoral politics to to make real systemic change because if we don't do that then this government right now that's quite just about completely corrupt and run by big money and corporations it's going to crush us and it's going to crush anything we do if we don't have some recognition of it and some some plan and and some actions for dealing with it i I feel like a lot of people on the left have have given up on democracy itself and i I feel like 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 the most successful psyop the the establishment has managed is getting us to give up on our own democracy and the other thing I'd say about it is, is we need to stop focusing on specific people and specific candidates. You know, we need to focus on the money always and focus on, you know, what are our demands and think in terms of, of interests. You know, what are the interests of that top 0.1% versus the interests of the 99%? Because that's really what's going on here. Yeah, I agree with you a lot on on the concept of of not getting uh, locked into certain people, uh, because that's one thing that we see now in the current political spectrum is this whole cult of personality. You see this with figures like your Nancy Pelosi's and stuff like that. So it's like, well, yeah, that, that's AOC. a good point. Is AOC is a big one. When when we are thinking about incumbents, yeah, it, it should ideally be be people that are that are just talking about the facts. It's like they're not even necessarily a person. They're just, there's just a vessel there for the political facts that should be going forward. What, what we've cultivated now with, with just this obsession over uh, individuals in politics, it, it's very propagandized. And so moving towards our theme, our, our core of this of demands, there was um, a conversation recently that Chris Hedges had with Shama Sawant. And Chris Hedges, of course, is, is awesome. You know, recommend him. He's on Substack now because, of course, he got deplatformed. And in this conversation, which we're going to play a little bit here that he had with Shama Sawant, she talks about demands. Uh, you know, the ALU did not agree with all of that, and in, it was because they decided to build independently, and then they did many things that most labor leaders haven't done in the last... And she's talking here about uh, the Amazon Labor Union, the ALU, and how they, they won their strike vote. ...last four decades, which is, one, they led with concrete demands. You know, they, t- they didn't talk about the union as an abstract entity, they have made it very clear to the workers in the warehouse and workers made it clear to workers in the warehouse that we need a union because don't you agree that we need to win a thirty dollar an hour starting wage don't you agree that we need job security don't you think that we deserve a say in scheduling don't you think that we should get full-time hours if we want them you know it was two concrete issues that they were able to build uh, in this kind of solidarity you know shop floor solidarity where it, you know, you may not agree, you may not get wor- workers to agree on every single thing on this plan and on every ideological issue, but if you can get agreement on a core group of concrete demands, and that is a solid basis for building a unified struggle. So that was the part that that really uh, tweaked my attention was when she's talking about a concrete uh, list of core demands that everyone in your movement can agree on. That's kind of what I have in mind. My thinking is, is not so much that it's that it's me or it's or it's a particular person that needs to come up with this list or it has to be this certain list, but we we need to figure out how to be collaborating on the left to get to some version of that to where we can say these these are our demands. This is what we're we're organizing around. This is this is the core of our, of our movement. She even mentioned a little later on in the interview that we need campaigns organized around demands and not personality politics. 
Yeah, definitely. It's uh, one thing that, that's always a little dystopian is, is when you go onto candidates' websites and go onto their issues page, if we're just talking about like a garden variety Democratic or Republican candidate, and it's just very mealy-mouthed nonsense uh, issues. So, yeah, um, I, I, I know, you know, we, we have some demands that we're going to share, but yeah, it's definitely something that should collaborate through without the left. And one of the kind of de- demanding in a general way, you know, that, that Democrats do better, you know, that, that used to be enough. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that was kind of the Bernie movement in a sense of, you know, and that, of course, is the AOC, the squad movement is this idea that that we're going to, to get Democrats to do better. And I think for most of us in, I don't know, what would we call it? Yeah, the, the force the vote left, the Jimmy Dore left. We're 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 past that, but but not everyone is. Well, I, I think those are people that we almost have to collect up because I actually think 2020 was 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 important for people if they don't realize it because because I think a lot of Democratic voters uh, were Bernie people and then they were force fed Joe, and they, they didn't like that, and so and so now what's happening <laughs> is. Chill. Yeah, so now what's happening is they're becoming abstaining voters. They just don't vote anymore. <laughs> what they don't know is that they're lefties <laughs> mm-hmm. and that they need to be in this progressive movement. Uh, but it's 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 part of capturing some of those people in uh, because they're just uh, cynical. <laughs> you know, so that's that's part of what we're going up against, which is created. And we have the, the, the Democrats, the Democratic Party on the left still still trying to, to run the same game. And, you know, the latest part of this, I mean, of course, it, it comes out of Orange Man Bad, mm-hmm. Trump, you know, Trump, 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 everything. And then that um, went into January 6th, end of the world, right? The coup that never really came close to the, uh, the insurrection, the insurrection <laughs> that I heard the FBI recently came out and said that they've been able to find no evidence of um, central organization for that uh, January 6th riot means that they, they weren't able to find anybody who wasn't an active law enforcement officer. <laughs> they investigating themselves. <laughs> but um, well, yeah. that's what they're not doing, and that's why, well, well we won't get into too much of that. But uh. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole thing was a mess, and the, the vast majority of those people... Are, they, they, are, are, they've are, arrested like, like four or 500 people, yeah. and, and no one seems to be a leader or an organizer <laughs> within, within all of that. And yet there are, are tweets and things I just heard the other day going back to December before that saying, oh, we're going to do something on January 6th. We're, we're, but. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing because then it, it, can be, it can be used as propaganda of, of oh, well, you know, this, this is why this is what people that don't follow the status quo do. They go and they, you know, go for the capital and, and whatnot is, is one of those tricky things I think about because th- those are almost just kind of like lost citizens just like we are. They're just kind of on the wrong side of things. They, they know that things are corrupt. They know that the money is bought everything. They're just kind of their, – their answer, their solution is a little bit different. But, uh, but yeah, it, it just – This is part of the problem. Is yeah. That if we on the left don't provide a path, don't provide – reasons for this and a way to change things to make things better yeah then where are they going to go they're going to go to the trump or yeah the right-wing demagogue who is who is telling them you know look i agree with you and here's what we're going to do oh yeah definitely like like that's one thing that that trump well trump proved a couple of things but the couple of things that i'm going to point out is is one is that qualifications for the presidency are, are arbitrary you know this whole thing where they called Hillary Clinton the most qualified person it's it's arbitrary really like US citizen natural born over 35 is is really like just about it and even that's kind of silly there should be a, mm-hmm. an amendment but uh but yeah Trump proved that uh and then the other thing that he proved is that populism works the 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 trick is that we just want progressive socialist populism but he did prove that what the people want is populism. They 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 want somebody that's going to be out there. And they want to hear somebody calling them corrupt. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Even yeah, even though he was lying through his teeth. No, he was one of them. <laughs> even though he was one of them, and he was lying through his teeth. They loved that message of, of uh, what did he call it? The uh, the swamp, or yeah, I think mm. it was clean the swamp or something. Well, was his, his thing. joke? Is he he drained his swamp, and at the bottom of it, of it he found his cabinet, but. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm stealing from Jimmy Dore that one too, but um, that's good. But speaking of January 6th, as ridiculous it is, it, it's what the Democrats are, are going with. I mean, it's it's what they think is going to, to help them in the election. Here is 
of Marianne Williamson saying, you know, the live January 6th hearings on TV right now are already very powerful, definitely worth watching, important. And it, it's a, I mean, what do you even say to that? I mean, it's just. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that it's like uh, people. It's one of those things that where 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 she, where she does it for she does it for the validation, right? It's because you know everybody can kind of get their get themselves worked up She's over something. The game. Yeah, and it's you know, and it, and it's what they're on right now, and it's what they're they're hitting. That's what the spirits told her, by the way. Marianne <laughs> Williamson talks to spirits. She doesn't always let people know that, but. I and I, I joke because she she's become this political machine, but uh, but her uh, her background is, is spiritualism and being a spiritual teacher. And so one thing I, I love is like right, right under this tweet about you know how the January six hearings are so important. Here, here's some video <laughs> from um, uh, from that great insurrection. Oh, what's this and guy's name? A, I forget what his name is. Q in on shaman. shaman. Yeah, Q in on you know, shaman. And there's, and there's the, uh, the with a police escort. There's, there's the <laughs> cops there keeping, you know, um, keeping everybody out. And th- this officer here is like, he's, he's asking them politely, like, like, would they leave the Senate <laughs> chamber? And then this guy is like bleeding because he got a rubber bullet to the face or something. But any chance I could get you guys to leave the Senate wing? And, you know, and, okay, just want to let you guys know this is a, you know, sacred is place. <laughs> oh, man. So very, you know, very serious threat to democracy here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like, uh, yeah, it's one of those little stra- stranger, than, stranger than fiction kind of little scenes there. The cops seem pretty polite, honestly. It's- I, it's it's part of how that whole thing went down. It's yeah. So in terms of the the problem at hand, you know, what do we do about this this democracy? This would be democracy, you know, that we're in. And I, I feel like the the, num- the number one challenge right now for us on the left in electoral politics is is getting people on the ballot that we'd actually want to vote for. Yeah. Um, and it's. I don't know if there's an easy answer for that. I mean, you know, I go back to the demands and that we have this core list of, of demands that can be a start as far as who you'd want to get behind and, and who you'd not want to get behind. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just vote third party is 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 withhold all votes, mm-hmm. financial contributions, time spent volunteering to to the two major uh candidates i mean me personally i would i would rather vote for a libertarian candidate versus versus either of them not because i'm a big libertarian but just because it's third party Mm -hmm. uh and so that's what i advocate to do or if there's a green candidate out a green candidate would be perfect but my but my point is 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 where i'm at right now anything third party is fine you know i'd rather vote for nader you know or somebody like that than just vote you know republican or democrat and there's also part of it, and, and Hedges has talked about this at times, in that you, you don't have to necessarily win. Yeah. If you if you get um, if you're getting into getting five to fifteen percent of the vote, then you have leverage. Then you can have some big leverage. Oh yeah. And and you can be like a kingmaker, and so oh yeah. You know, even just reaching to that point can be significant. Yep. Well, it's like what they uh, like going back to the force the vote stuff. The squad could have done it squad could have done it they had mm-hmm. that power but yeah and speaking of force the vote there, there's been some um i don't know what you'd call it some some chatter <laughs> we call it some chatter on the lefty intertubes about um possibly the man himself jimmy door maybe making some kind of run draft jimmy draft jimmy Ooh, there you go draft jimmy yeah and uh and there was some talk about this on um on our favorite show savvy sabs recently yeah when she had uh jackson door on jackson jackson door, jackson door. no danny boy door danny boy door danny boy hinkle Can't danny boy hinkle. Hinkle. Yeah, he's jackson the vp hinkle is he oh, holding up to be vp the vp Not, well, well i i think I think you can be VP at any age. Oh, okay. But but you you wouldn't be able to ascend to the presidency. It oh, might be. okay. I'm not sure if that restriction is on the VP or not. We'd that's uh, yeah, that that's up. a good question. But um, but here here's what they had to say about it the other day on our favorite show, Savvy Sabs. Um, that's why I strongly support the idea. Jimmy's been talking a lot about it. He's been thinking Whoa. a lot about it. Uh, there's a lot of people 
who are very notable, who are encouraging him to do this, uh, including Chris Hedges, although he's given fair warning to run for president in 2024. I think he'd have a I think he'd have a fighting chance as a third party. You know, they he's if you look at the media aspect, who loves him? Tucker Carlson, number one news show in the nation. Joe Rogan, number one show in the nation. Russell Brand, yeah. number one news political show in the nation. Uh, you look at his, the political realignment happening in this country right now. Jimmy Dore embodies that. Uh, you look at the fighting spirit. He has it. I, th- I think he'd be a great candidate. And um, he'd definitely scare the shit out of a lot of people in D.C. I think so, too. <laughs> so there you go. It's it's. You know, I remember that they used to when when this would come up on on the, on the Jimmy Dore show, Jimmy and, and Steph would just would just laugh it out of hand. We'd just be like, "No, no, we'll never do that." And they're they're kind of I don't know. It seems like you know, yeah, I, it seems like they're thinking about. It's like it. the TV show that Zelensky was on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, we got we got to make a show about a comedian. Yeah, who who then. Um, a sense of the presidency. Yeah, so that for, so for people that don't know, it's basically just that there's a, there's a show called Servant of the Servant of the People that the Ukrainian president Zelensky he was an actor before he was president, and so on the show he's a he's a school teacher and a, like a comedian type, and somebody films him uh, doing some sort of political speech, and so it, it turns out that he becomes president. So that's what we got to do with Jimmy Dore. So we just gotta we gotta like have him produce just like that one video that just takes off and goes viral. And then build a build a candidacy behind it. No, but seriously, I mean that that would, um, yeah. I mean it, it it would be incredible just to get uh, somebody like that. I know Jimmy Dore is a, a controversial figure. You don't have to agree with everything that he says, but it's undeniable that he is a major intellectual force behind the progressive movement in America today. And so having somebody like that getting into the getting into the discussion would be a big deal. Oh, or getting into debates <laughs> or getting into oh i would love i would love 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 to see jimmy Dore up on stage with with the cast of characters that we're used to seeing <laughs> it's kind of hard to imagine but it'd be quite something yeah i mean bernie wouldn't even go on his show so we'd he's got to go on their show <laughs> no yeah i mean yeah it's it's even considering all of the you know free campaigning that he did for bernie aoc went on his show before she was aoc not literally but before she was the aoc we know today of course not since (laughs) not since she not since she was elected no but when she was a candidate she did when she needed him (laughs) when she needed him and he and he gave her a lot of support he really he really boosted her up and so um i think i i think i would speak for a lot of people that that we would go well the phrase I would kind of use is uh, is a uh, balls to the walls for for a Jimmy Dore candidacy. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I, yeah, wow. I, I think so. Yeah, I definitely think so. Uh, and and most of all, you know, just somebody that that's going to say "f you" to the establishment publicly and talk about the money. Do you know that phrase, balls to the wall? Balls to the wall. I know the <laughs> phrase. I mean, it's a phrase people say. I don't know what it's from. I, I actually found myself saying it the other day, so, so I looked it up. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it actually comes from um, pilots, and so they would have um, on their control stick uh, uh, one or two of these little control balls. And so, oh. and so when you were going like full throttle, you'd push that all the way to the to the end, to the wall. And so... Oh. They would say we're going in balls to the wall. Last news to me, I always thought it has a new testicles. I, well, that, that's yeah. I guess that could be a reason not to use it, but too late. I mean, I say it. I, I don't know. And so, yeah, I mean, the the the, the core thing here when we're talking about uh, people running is, is that we need to encourage any kind of candidates, and certainly any candidates we're going to give support to, to be talking about demands and to be uh, pledging to to certain demands. So. Uh, segueing into into demands we need to be thinking about what these can look like you know i've i've come up with a list and that's on my favorite website and yours erictred.com at the moment you have 11 of them so i figured i'd call it 11 demands for real democracy and that's right uh these demands go to 11 and what does that make us think of? <laughs> Spinal tap. You can see, yeah. the numbers all go to 11. Why don't you just make 10 make that a little loud? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> These go to 11. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Classic bit there. Yeah. <laughs> so, going to 11. Well, let's see what we got there. Let me bring back this page. 
So should we talk about some demands? Let's do it. All right. So number one, healthcare. One of the things that I think if if we're going to put together a list of demands is, is, is we shouldn't be settling for for the half measures we shouldn't be settling for for the compromises and one of the things that's always said about uh, medicare for all is that even that's a compromise and so number one is the idea of, of you know demanding beyond that you know implement a the united states national health care system essentially what the uk has you know um, but make it better you know figure out what are the best parts of their systems uh, what are the parts that you don't want to emulate? We can make a really good healthcare system. I mean, it's you know we know how to do it. It's a matter of, oh, well, you know the usual things of of getting the the big for profit players out of it. It's what's going to have to happen. So it's you know include all the best aspects of other systems around the world. Reject all privatization. You know you really have to get profit out of the system. You know private profit. It's just not compatible with health really and certainly not with a healthcare system and you don't want it to cover all aspects you know it, you know really it's it's this stuff has been been talked about for a while it's really not a big mystery <laughs> how you can do this um, yeah i think a bit of the big thing with with here is is that the healthcare system should be accessible and understandable by a lay person i say this all the time about laws mm-hmm. is that the problem with laws is they're written so that you need a law degree you take the constitution the foundation of our country and our laws the constitution was written for a lay person to be able to read and understand it it's very simple similar to how the um the amendment for uh mm-hmm. citizens united and taking the oh, right. and we'll 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 talk about that yeah but uh we'll but to amend move to amend. But yeah, so there, there's there's been a, a whole field that within the healthcare system of healthcare navigators of people that help people navigate through the system. That is that's a, that's a problem. So it, with, if if you, if you got a system that that you need to pay someone to help someone else navigate. Right, then there's a, a problem. bad system. <laughs> right. And so with with the national healthcare system, some something that a lay person can easily understand. They understand what plan they're in, they understand what plan what their options are in their healthcare team. So, you know, really shouldn't be something hard to agree on <laughs> you know of course it's one of those things that that just has huge support you know all across the political spectrum uh, respond to the climate emergency you know obviously <laughs> it has to be really a non-corporate it has to be a real grassroots green new deal and not just another way to give more money to huge corporations it has to be something more like uh, the original new deal what fdr did things like that Things like um, federal jobs guarantee, you know, big public works programs, all that can can go into it. But it's not going to happen if the plan is to get private corporations to, to jump in and do it. That's the opposite. Um, end all drilling and extraction of federal property, you know, end subsidies to fossil fuel companies, you know, massively expand green subsidies. So really pretty, pretty low hanging fruit stuff, I think. Yeah, definitely. Criminal justice reform. Now, for, for this one, I do um, basically a little bit of a cheat, and I um, and I reference uh, the ten demands for justice, which is something that um, Nick and others at Revolutionary Blackout Network uh, came up with, um, and I think we can take a peek at that. Yeah, so definitely check out the ten demands for justice at tenforjustice.com. Uh, they have put together a, a great list as, as, it, as it applies to the criminal justice system, and so there's no point in us trying to replicate it. Uh, the, the basis is, uh, is to end uh, carceral punishment for any kind of unnecessary uh, person, basically. They, any, they any kind the of the road to abolition. The road to abolition, yeah. So basically, that means abolition both of, of policing as we know it and of prisons and the and carceral prison, state right. as we know it. Right, yeah. So, uh, you know... Basically, turning the criminal justice system into what it's supposed to be, which is a rehabilitatory arm uh, based on law enforcement being within the community and controlled by the community. Basically, looking to to end what what you're having with the, with the abuse of of, for example, the Thirteenth Amendment, with all kinds of essentially prison slave labor, all the bad things that happen within the criminal justice system, plea bargaining, just all the all the really. Uh, very, very disruptive and, and really kind of evil things that happened in the criminal justice system uh, to, to try to remedy that. So, yeah, for, for those demands, we've referenced the 10 demands for justice. 
and we don't have time to do a deep dive into them, but one of them that I will highlight, which is very important, is, is reparations. And, and reparations can be tricky because a lot of people will talk about reparations, but you know what's, what's really meant by that? And so I, I think they did a really good job in here of, of talking about an approach to, to really getting a handle on that. They're talking about uh, the Commission to Study Reparation Act and mandating Congress to, to, to implement what that comes up with. They also uh, mentioned uh, Native Americans and, and those aspects of, of reparations. All right, back to the 11 demands list. Uh, number four, we have, uh, implement a minimum standard of living. And what I'm kind of trying to do with this one is, is again, to think bigger, to not just be coming in, not, not just be demanding $15 minimum wage, you know, at, at this point. I mean, of course, that's even uh, way lower <laughs> than it even should be. Uh, but it, it, that's, that's, that's a compromise demand to even start with. So you know, I'm, I'm proposing, you know, let's let's increase the minimum wage in step with how the wages of the top one percent have increased. You know, let's take a look at that, and you'll see this this you know this steep <laughs> up uh, line of how their wages have gone up. And so you know, let's look at you know, can we be doing that for the ninety nine percent? If you're talking about standard of living, of course, that gets you into things like housing, you know, homes for all, housing first programs. Uh, those kind of things. And I know homelessness, houselessness, and whatnot is a big issue for you, Corey. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'm one that believes, uh, because I'm, I'm a kind of a crime guy, criminology guy, I'm one that believes that the lack of housing and health care and economic opportunities is the basis for a lot of, of what we consider to be crime. So what, what it really comes down to and what number four, I think, is really talking about is, is just to lessening human suffering of, of our fellow citizens. And by, by doing that and by elevating up people's standard of living, uh, we're just going to end up with, with a better, more equitable society as it is. Like, can we have a country that's not brutal? <laughs> Like, how's that for a demand? <laughs> yeah, what it comes down to is that people are living vastly different lives in the, in the U.S., and it's about elevating up those that are, are living below those that are uh, eating 10 times their share. And so we have to even that. Speaking of eating, you know, there's the idea to create free and open food pantries. I mean, you know, we could do this. <laughs> But, you know, America is as wealthy as anything, is what I like to say. And, you know, we could do that. We could just have, you know, federally funded food pantries that are just there for people who need food and they can get it as needed. It's not, it's not that hard to do. Provide a good job at a living wage to anyone who wants one, otherwise known as the federal job guarantee. And that can get you into things like... Um, you know, MMT style thinking that, that can be tied into MMT and that and the funds are there. The government can create money at will. And, and if you're creating money and putting it into, into jobs, it's not going to be inflationary. In fact, there are MMT economists who, who make really good arguments that creating money, injecting it federal dollars into the economy towards things like federal jobs, towards like, like jobs for people who need jobs is actually anti-inflationary. It actually ships money into the economy and it cycles through and it does the opposite of inflation. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. I mean, you get you give people higher wages, that, that money's coming right back into the economy. When you give rich people money, that, that goes to offshore bank accounts and mm -hmm. it doesn't stay in the economy. Luxury good, even in yeah. Things that just don't. It don't a, help us. Well, even just to, even just looking at the the stimulus checks, which happened over the pandemic, I, that was beneficial to the economy and the and the citizenry. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a good example of of not not not, the not inflation wasn't happening then. It wasn't no, you know? and and even though I I don't think that that how that went about was the right way to distribute it. It did it did create a a use case in, in showing that it was possible. Things got better for a lot of people with that money. Mm -hmm. Mandate paid parental leave. Um, yeah. Eliminate student loan debt. You know, these are, you know, can be big topics, you know, on their own. But they they get into this whole idea of of 
you know, a standard of living that everyone could at least abide by. Yeah, definitely. And I know that we've talked about this, that the student loan debt can also be kind of a questionable one because there is a certain amount of privilege that somebody with student loans do have, but you know, it's still important. The other thing too we, is- We can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, 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 I'm just saying it's not, wouldn't be my top of the list, but the other thing too is, is, uh, is, in terms of like, you know, if, if people are wondering, like, is it this bad? In fact, it is. You know, I live in the city. It's a little bit easier when you live in the city. There's there's all kinds of different people on the economic ladder. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that people are starving in our country. It's a, it's a national shame, and, and that's something we need to care about. Moving on to number five, and the wars, cut military spending. Again, it's something, one of these that really should be low-hanging fruit for, for the left, really Really, for anyone who's not a neocon or a warmonger, you would think, but there's so much propaganda out there that it, it's like, whatever happened to the anti-war movement? You know, you gotta, you gotta wonder. It, yeah, I mean, unless you hold stock in Raytheon yeah. or Lockheed Martin, war does not benefit you. It's just period. And so, you know, I would say we should have a demand of, you know at least, you know, reduce the military budget by 20%, you know, each year. And even that, you know, you can make an argument for, you know, is, is that not nearly enough? Is that um, outlandish? It's, you know, it's, you know, maybe a starting point. And I, I see other, other demands out there from groups who will sometimes say things like, you know, our demand is we, we stop increases in military spending. <laughs> you know, that, that's like a, a Democratic Party aligned style demand. <laughs> And I'm just like, no, we should be we should be advocating deep cuts. Yeah, definitely. And and let, let's let's say even you are one of the people that for whatever reason you you believe that the United States should maintain the the highest military. You know, most most money going to military in the, in the world. We we can still significantly cut back significantly and still be the biggest military in the world. It is just we, ins- we, we might only be five times the rest yeah. of the world combined instead of ten times. <laughs> yeah, if, if if you're not up to the numbers, which I'm sure a lot of people are, it is just insane the amount of money that we give to the military industrial complex. It's one of those. It's one of those things that this the scale of the military spending and and the, our military footprint around the world. It's one of those things that's just so huge, so gargantuan, so kind of hard to take in that it, it almost it almost it, it benefits them it's like if, if people if, if what we might call the the quote-unquote normies start start looking into it, it it's like they their their brains just shut off because it's just too too much to comprehend how bad it is yeah definitely and on this bulletin point too talking about uh patriot act espionage act the, these have uh the the military industrial complex has its intersection within mass surveillance to mass surveillance of the of the public uh, yeah, and we're seeing it now in the censorship, and and all that things. And censorship is going to be an item below. While we're still on this one, um, sale of military weapons. I mean, it, like, do you remember Corey when um, arms dealers used to be considered bad guys? <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, we yeah. are one. <laughs> yeah, the biggest one, in fact. I mean, how is that even a thing? You know, so you know, obviously that. We need to demand for that to, to stop. I mean, it, it just it just needs to stop. It's, you know, the, the idea that, that this is our thing. I yeah. This is one of our biggest um, uh, areas and businesses of manufacturing left in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, we, we are. Guns and giving them to anyone who wants to buy them, including well-enlightened democracies like Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi Arabia. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother can of worms, <laughs> our relationship with Saudi Arabia. But yeah, what it comes down to is we are the biggest arms dealer and uh, we accept cash, credit, debit. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly cash, US dollars. <laughs> Bitcoin, Ethereum. <laughs> if, you have, if you have assets, we'll take them and we'll give you weapons. Well, we, we get the assets regardless, but the resources, but... <laughs> <laughs> And um, and so one of the the places of pushback you'll get is, is what about the jobs? You know, people are, are gonna are gonna lose jobs. And and you know the counter to that is you know the next bullet point you you replace these military jobs with you know federal jobs guaranteed, green jobs. It can be all kinds of things. You yeah. Know, in the sciences, I mean, we, we it, it's really not a hard problem. 
if yeah. we decide to tackle it as a country. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 who we. There's plenty of other jobs, better jobs, we can give people. Mm. We don't need these military industrial complex jobs. And of course, this ties into imperialist policies, which of course we can do a whole show on that. But yep. but that really needs to be to be reformed in a big way. Just just how how we act on the world stage and and what we're about. And also, uh, you know, just just for for the people that 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 work within the military, like their military enlisted people, uh, you know, that that that's also a very abusive workplace. If I can just say one little anecdote, one thing that somebody mm-hmm. once told me is they said that at at one point the army uh, had had a cook's corps. There were cooks from the army, and they that was that was their job. They they cooked all these meals, and it was a it was a proud thing. You know, people were able to do that. Several years ago, the uh, the military, uh, the army rather, because it's not the same with every service. The army got rid of their cooks corps, and they hired Cisco, the company, to do all of their food service. And it is stupid expensive. I can't give you the exact numbers, but there's basically no cheaper labor, legal labor that you can have outside of a prison in the US than an army private. They're essentially US government government property and they they're paid very very little. And so uh, all that contracting that went in the military industrial complex, it literally is just to, to benefit those that benefit from those contracts because we went from having a, a completely uh, cheap way of, of feeding the army soldiers to, to having Cisco do it poorly, mind you, for a huge amount of cash. So that, that also gets into the privatization issue and just all that, that BS. And then there's... You know, I'll just hit the last one quick here. Pro- prohibit U.S. intelligence agencies from conducting propaganda and psyop operations against our own people. It used to be illegal for those agencies to do propaganda type programs on the American people, on, on the U.S. public. And I think it was in the AUMF. They basically repealed that. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously that's that's something that that should be prevented, that should be uh, prohibited. And because of course a big part of this is um, is propaganda. And that's um, something our friend Caitlin Johnstone talks about. Um, she accurately describes the um, American citizens as the most propagandized populace in the world. And uh, I think that's very true. I agree. <laughs> Immigration reform. Um, this one's nice and simple, as it yeah. should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes and no. I mean, there there could be more items in this. You know, as I'm always saying with all of this, you know, the the intent is to collaborate. You know, and not to to pass this down like Moses coming down from the hill with the tablets. But um, but yeah, at least uh, hitting immigration reform. You know, abolishing ICE. We don't need it. We didn't yeah. used to have it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless unless you're a Native American, uh, I don't think you have a good claim for immigration <laughs> being bad. If you're a Native American, then you have a great claim for it being bad. Uh, I had a teacher once tell me that if there's ever a day when, when people around the world no longer want to come to the United States for opportunity, then that's the day you no longer want to be here. Immigration is what makes this country great, period. And, of course, we want to provide a real path to citizenship for everyone. All right, number seven is a big one, censorship. As we've been seeing recently, the, the censorship just only seems to, uh, to get worse and worse. And they are, you know, they're, they're finding new and innovative ways to censor, whether it's Twitter, YouTube. Now, we're, recently we're seeing censorship by um, PayPal and, and these companies that do the monetary transactions in Canada. You saw Trudeau and his goons just not even think twice about just saying, oh, we're going to go after bank accounts of protesters because, you know, because they have, what was his word for it, unacceptable opinions. <laughs> so, yeah, protect freedom of speech from censorship and, you know, whether that's coming from government or corporations, which, of course, isn't such a, um, a big difference anymore. You see them working hand in hand. Um, you got... Uh, government threatening uh, Silicon Valley and tech companies to do what they want or face regulation and antitrust actions. You have uh, the corporations in Silicon Valley doing the bidding of government in pretty pretty direct hand-in-hand ways. Uh, you get things like uh, uh, breaking up the large corporations 
I'm like at reorganizing them, you know, worker co-op style, things like that. Because I mean, you, you can go beyond simply breaking them up. Like there is that idea of, you know, you could reorganize them and, and give them to the employees. And if these companies are being run by their employees, you can have a lot better shot at having better policies and better leadership. Uh, it's the idea of um, common carrier style rules. And this is where, where things like if you, um, it applies to like your telephone, your, your, and even your cell phone, things like that, where they're, they're basically mandated to, um, to provide the service for everybody. And it's not this idea that, oh, if someone says the wrong thing, you know, on the phone that, that, that they can get their phone cut off. If there's something that problematic happening on the service, then it sh it'll be illegal under, under the law and you, you bring legal authorities into it and you process it from there. There's the concept of due process, which touches on this next one, you know, even within the terms of service and how these uh, corporations and these media companies are running, you, you can have rules and regulations that disallow these deletions and deplatforming except where they have a real due process and that's you know transparent and fair and democratic and the other big one with um with these tech companies and places like youtube and twitter are the algorithms uh, which are quite completely opaque and so that needs to be made um be tra transparent it's a public needs to be looked at you tend to things like opening them up more along you know open source type of, of grounds and so what, what they do right now with these algorithms is, is they they're made to addict you to the service to, to just keep you coming back and, and they don't care whether they're pulling you in a lefty direction or a right direction or whether they're pulling you towards scientific real scientific facts and truths or whether they're pulling you towards conspiracy things or things that are not true like like they don't care they, they just want you to keep keep clicking keep viewing keep the eyeballs on it because that's that's where the money is and it's all about um, the ad revenues and the profits and so in order to fix that you, you're gonna have to deal with the algorithms you know and that's going to to mean you know opening those up and looking at those and regulating them in some fashion or like in the previous point you know reorganizing the corporation itself yeah, definitely. I know that you've talked about open source being uh, something that, that we want to look for in the platforms we use. All right. So these first seven are kind of what I view as the, the, the policy ones. And getting into number eight and the money, the big one kind of gets into the more the systemic change aspect of this in, in the idea of, of how do we really get from, from here to there. And as always, it's Focus on the money, you know, you follow the money and you'll see what's really going on. And as we all know, it, 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 at this point, Congress is bought and paid for. It's, um, it's a big money game. That's who they serve. You know, the donors are their constituency, not us. And that's what we're going to have to deal with if, if we're going to make real systemic change. That's the core of it. And so it's just the influence of big money in politics and government. So how can you do that? This reminds me of, there's something Caitlin Johnstone said a while back in that she said all of the potential solutions to these big problems are, they're, they're all hard. They're all gonna look nearly impossible. And so anything you come up with, people are gonna be able to look at that and say, oh, that's, that'll never happen. You know, that's too hard. But if, if we're accepting the challenge and if we're saying that, you know, we, we have to have a working democratic government, then you know, really the task then I would submit is to choose the least worst option, you know, the, the, the option that has the best chance of succeeding. You know, that's really what you're left with. And so if you're talking about dealing with, with the money, then you get into these options, like at the state and local level, you know, enact uh, ballot measures for clean elections and public financing of campaigns. And that one's far from impossible. Uh, Massachusetts had a uh, clean elections law on, on the books until the legislature and its wisdom uh, wiped it off. <laughs> but it was on there. It can be on there again. And uh, and of course, that was uh, originally put 
into law by by the public the the public of massachusetts in an election ballot question brought that in and then the legislature later on its own nixed that law yep and savvy sabs did a story just recently and they they had a similar situation where they had a ballot initiative an anti-corruption initiative that went through and then the legislature used emergency rules <laughs> to undo it and even undo it like immediately <laughs> and they they just crushed it wow then you got the big boy at the federal level as you're gonna have to deal with the federal level that's where the money is that's where the power is and the the best fix that i've seen at this point is would be a constitutional amendment where you you need to overturn this idea this current status quo in law that money is speech and corporations are people and so you need a constitutional amendment really to overturn that or else the supreme court is going to look very negatively on any type of really good campaign finance laws you pass whether at the federal or the state level corruption you're going to need to deal with corruption you know needs to be investigated prosecuted you're going to need to deal with revolving door politics where you know you have maybe a softer form of corruption where someone gets in goes from having a job in industry and then to a job in government and if if they get sick of that or if they lose their seat then they go back to industry and a big payout and you get that revolving door that's a big part of the corruption yeah we want to try to as best as possible dismantle the professional political class because that's what you have here Mm -hmm. and then transparency is a big one you know we need to be demanding radical transparency for all representatives and, and all agencies. Election reform. This is a big one as well because one of the things I'll hear from well, lefties, I'm sure the righties too, is what's the point of voting? You know, elections are rigged. And um, yeah, there's, I mean, it, it's hard to know for sure how rigged they are, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, certainly the primaries they certainly have big issues. You certainly saw that um, during Bernie's runs. Yeah. You know, there was certainly some pretty clear rigging there. So, you know, so what are we going to do about that? Are we just going to say elections are rigged? What's the point of voting? Just, we're done. Or are we going to demand that the elections not be rigged? And so towards demanding that, you can say you know, demand is make all voting machines and software be open source and auditable by the public. Seems very, very uh, rational. Yeah, when, when you ha- when you have an election, it's it's gonna get in the computer at some point, right? Even if you have paper ballots, it's yeah. I mean, that cat's out of the bag. It's it's gonna be it counted in, in in a computer at some point. We talked about this in a in another episode a while back. Um, that's another video that people can can check out, or I put it up as a clip. How to fix elections? If you want some more detail on that and those ideas around open source and what can be done about it. Um, Ranked choice voting, of course, is a big one. Get rid of the spoiler effect. That can be implemented at even, that really gets implemented at the state level. I mean, even even federal elections really happen state by state. So you get into ballot initiatives and things like that. It's, It's doable, you know, we need to demand it. Definitely. Ballot access is a big one. It's a big part of the problem. It, it, it is hard to get on the ballot, depending on which state you're in and so forth. And it's something that if it's, if it's not happening, if there are things you know, in where the system's not fair, the bars are too high to get on and things like that, that's where direct action comes in. That's where demanding and getting in the streets. And you can demand ballot initiatives. You can be demanding that legislatures pass laws to open up ballot access. But we're going to have to demand it. Another thing that's out there is the good old electoral college put in by the uh, the old slave owning founding fathers. Of course, it was mostly property owning was the big thing. Of course, yeah. it was the same to them. Yeah, so, and so that you know is an obvious one that should be dealt with. But this is one of these cases where you can get into creative ways to deal with this. There's a concept called you know, national popular vote that's been out there where you don't necessarily have to have a constitutional amendment to get rid of the electoral college. It'd be nice. It's the ideal way to do it is to have an amendment. But what you could do is you can have an interstate compact that says if every state agrees that the winner of the popular vote will get all of their electors for the presidency. 
And if you did that and you get more than 50% of the states to agree to that, you've gotten rid of the electoral college because then it, you know, practical matters, becomes a, an election for president based on a popular vote. So, you know, there are creative solutions out there as well that we should be thinking about. Taxation and funding. And of course, that's a big one. There's, this is another one where I'm kind of trying to get into to reaching further. And so you could say we're going to abolish all the taxes, except for having a highly progressive tax on income and on large wealth and on large corporations. And that's really how the tax system should run. This idea that you've got a sales tax and tax on every little thing that we do, it's really just a form of wealth distribution. That's really a way to transfer wealth from all of us, the 99% up to that 0.1%. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I agreed, especially especially on sales tax. I always tell people that homeless people pay sales tax, and it always takes them a second to think about it. And they're like, oh, yeah, got it. And you've talked about the, the complexity of, of the tax law. and Yeah, what we were talking about earlier is that the, ta the tax law is written not to be user-friendly. And generally speaking, anytime a law is, is made not to be user-friendly, speaking about you just as a member of the general public, it's not there to benefit you. And so... This kind of really large reform and, and changing of, of the tax laws would, of course, be a huge simplification as well. Yes. And, of course, along with that, you're going to have to deal with the loop holes. This idea of that, that people aren't going to abide by it, if the rich are not abiding by it, then take away their citizenship. I mean, it's expel them if they're not going to follow the rules of taxation that are for the good of everyone. What I always what I always say on this topic is uh, you need to use the United States market as a weapon. So I don't think like a Jeff Bezos or anything like that would necessarily he might not like it, but I don't I don't think losing his American citizenship would be the end of the road for him. I think you would really need to to threaten him with losing the American market. That's that's that as well. that's what would hit his bottom line. And then um, another part of this is at the state, local governments, they don't issue their own currency. And so that can also be a pushback against MMT type theory and, and how to deal with things. But you could get creative with that and say, we're going to fund the state and locals on a per person basis with federal dollars. And you could just fund them that way. Right. There's nothing stopping us except the will to do so yeah it's a funny business because the states also do take in a lot of federal dollars so already yeah and again it gets into the simplification and things like that right all right getting down to the end number 11 democratize the enterprise and this is gets into richard wolf territory of um of trying to reorganize things and supporting worker co-ops and it's the idea of really not just saying we should do this, but getting into demanding that we use the power of the federal government and federal funds to, to push this along. I mean, right now, our government's basically hostile to the whole concept of worker-owned co-ops. That's something we need to flip. We need to demand that we have a government that not only isn't hostile to it, but incentivizes things like that, employee-owned and controlled businesses. And there are lots of ways you can do that in terms of financing, corporate rules, you know, things like that. Even as a spot along the way, this next point, you, know, you can mandate that publicly traded companies have board seats for employee representation. They, they do things like that in Germany. Even that one's like a pretty low-hanging fruit, really. There's breaking up the monopolies in the large corporations. And then we're talking about companies providing essential services. And when we talk about nationalizing things like YouTube and Twitter and things like that, you can even go beyond nationalizing. You can nationalize and reorganize them as employee controlled and governed utilities. Yeah, definitely. What it really comes down to is we need to uh, focus away from profit being the main motivator and look at metrics of general public having a high quality of life as what we need to aspire to in this country. Yeah, so um, after the demands, just one last story on the crime side that I wanted to bring up. So this is Rachel Rollins' site. She uh, Tell us about who Rachel Rollins is. Yeah, so Rachel Rollins, uh, she's a Boston-based attorney. She 
won a campaign uh, about four years ago to be the Suffolk County District Attorney. Suffolk County is the county that is Boston, Massachusetts, so it's a very urban county. So she she gained public attention for being known as a criminal justice reformer. I've talked about this before a little bit. So one of the big things that she came in uh, to, when she came into office was that she created this list of 15 charges in which the default was to decline prosecuting, essentially meaning that during her time as, as Suffolk County District Attorney, her office would not look to prosecute under uh, any of these. So trespassing, shoplifting, larceny, which is also known as theft, disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, receiving stolen property, minor driving offenses, uh, B&E, it says here where the uh, intent was to enter a vacant property to sleep, wanton or malicious destruction of property, threats, minor possession of alcohol, drug possession, drug possession with intent to distribute. This is a big one, a standalone resisting arrest charge including a resisting arrest charge, which is combined with any of these above. So for example, a trespassing and, and resisting arrest. So and what's kind of the thinking behind that? The thinking is, is as to why they, they would write that about a standalone resisting arrest charge. No, what, why with, with what she's doing with this whole list? Okay, so these are all what, what they call quality of life offenses. It, ca- it kind of gets down to the whole broken windows policing theory, which is, oh, this is the old school 80s thing that uh, if we just focus on these small small time crimes, then, then crime in, in the neighborhood would get better at all. What, what you'd really tend to see is it would be weapons for police to, to harass citizens. Uh, these these ten, these are going to be the kind of crimes that the, the saying that a cop can find something wrong, it's going to be these kind of things if they want to harass people, if they want to try to to search their persons. They can use any of these kind of crimes as a justification for that. Uh, so th- so even though I'm not going to go ahead and say that Rachel Rollins is perfect or anything like that, this was a, this was a big deal. Is, is a way that a, a, a DA can be a, a real progressive DA. Yeah, agreed, definitely. So There's part- not too many. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. So partially why, why I bring this up is because we're talking about demands. And, mm-hmm. and that is that the, these are the standards that we should be holding our elected officials to. You should look in to see what your local district attorney is. A district attorney is, uh, is considered the most individual powerful player in the criminal justice system. The reason it is this is because a district attorney makes the decision to either prosecute or not prosecute. And the decision lies solely in their hands. Meaning, in theory, this would never happen. But you could have uh, a murderer and the police arrest him. The district attorney could just say, I'm not going to prosecute and just let him scot-free. They could do that. That, that is within their power. And conversely, when a, any DA gets you in their sights, you are in a world of trouble. Oh, yeah, definitely. So the other thing, too, is, is we talk about the problems of the district attorneys uh, being really, really cozy with the police. In Massachusetts, we actually go a step further, and that is the Massachusetts State Police are considered the head detectives of the state. They take any major crime that exists outside of the three most populous cities in the state, and they are all attached to the district attorney's office. So the state police detectives are attached to whatever district attorney's office they they are in. So they are very, very, very cozy. So Rachel Rollins, in earlier this year, in January of 2022, she accepted a position of the U.S. Attorney of the District of Massachusetts, making her the new top federal prosecutor for Massachusetts. So she's uh, gone. She is gone from her role as Suffolk County District Attorney. So she goes gone. Yep. So the problem with that is the uh, new person that has taken up her spot named Kevin. He was an appointment of, of the Massachusetts governor, Charlie Baker, a Republican, uh, because the, we don't have a county government anymore. So when these seats are vacated, the governor appoints. Even though it's technically a county position, it, yeah, it goes to the governor to fill it. Right. And so the problem is her uh, her successor has basically said that he's not going to agree to committing to that being a non-charge again. Uh, so and this is an elected position. Is this an elected position? It is an elected position. He's currently interim mm-hmm. and he's expressed a desire to run. So he is going to have to go through an election process. And uh, I, I sincerely hope somebody comes in and primaries him. And, and that, that's really what it comes down to is these, these are what we should be demanding out of our public officials. And just don't forget some places uh, where you might live, there might be elected judges. We don't have elected judges here in Massachusetts. We do have elected district attorneys. These, these people that are players in the criminal justice system and the legal system are, are also people that we need to be continuing to put pressure on. And that's, that's really my point. Demands. 
yeah demands to have them demands hold uh hold your people up your elected representatives hold them up to a high standard and challenge them so in closing here what i what i think we are proposing is that we need to have this some kind of set of demands to really have it at the core of of what you call our movement our philosophy our principles because that becomes the guide that that becomes the glue that holds things together that becomes the standard by which you judge candidates and representatives when you have a a list of demands like this when when you have so-called progressive democrats like like the squad it's clear that they're not for these demands yes they're not supporting this they're not doing anything towards them yeah and so it becomes an easy decision as to whether or not you support democrats <laughs> if these are your demands and these are your principles then then no <laughs> the answer is no right yeah and it's it's uh not not important necessarily where the demands come i know people have got different ideas we should be collaborative um but the but the the real point is that when dealing with politics when dealing with politicians if we don't have those set of demands then we're just speaking and so on the way out i'll uh I'll highlight it one more time here, the erictred.com website. Where you can find this list. You can find links to videos and some other various thoughts and things on there. There's also at the bottom a, uh, a contact form. If people want to get in touch, it's possible to reach us that way. And I think that's about what we got for tonight. Yeah, stay lefty. All right. Crime and politics over and out. Over and out.